Now come with me quickly to uh, the book of Mark and chapter number one. Let's think about a little bit more what we talked about Monday night. If he wasn't here, we'll reiterate that. But I, I want to say that we must use every tool that God has given, given us to expedite and to facilitate the getting of the gospel to the ends of the earth. We must. It's not, it's not whether we should sit around and think about it. No, we must do it. Now, yesterday when I spoke on this, I, I was a little bit more, maybe more detailed in, in some areas. I, I want to speak to you just a little bit from my heart, and I love this intimate setting with just you all. I want to say something. If God is speaking to you about doing something that is somewhat a little bit out of the box, don't be scared by that. When I say out of the box, I say out of the box with our thinking, but within the Holy Scriptures. We would never do anything outside of the Holy Scriptures. When God put on my heart back in 1998 a passion that He had given me as a young man, I was so thrilled about that. Now, I'm, I'm somewhat of an excitable person, and, and that doesn't mean really anything other than I just told you. As a, as a young man in my 20s, uh, when God gave that to me, I, I, I jumped up, and I was, I was hooting and hollering. And, and now when I jump up, this right here bounces a little bit. But back then when I jumped up, I mean, it was, it was, it was all muscle, muscle back then. And I try to convince myself that it's all muscle now, but it really isn't. I was, I was thrilled. You know why? Because as a young man, as a young man, I always wanted to fly. The Bible says in the Psalms, it teaches us that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, He does give us the desires of our heart. That's the Bible truth. You know why? Because if we're delighted in the Lord, all those desires will bring glory to Him. We won't, we won't be on the fringes. See, being intimate with our God causes us to be intimate with the things that He's intimate with, which is people. I want to say to this setting today that the ministry is people. We're talking about a tool for the ministry. The ministry is people. The airplane never will preach the gospel. The airplane uh, never will confront someone about their soul. But the person in it will. And that person that's in that airplane will be able to challenge someone else about their soul, will be able to confront them about the need of the gospel, and it'll be a beautiful thing. When I was a young man, I always wanted to fly. When I was a young man going through school, it was me that was lined up to be the fighter pilot for our United States Air Force. I wanted to fly fighter aircraft. And God began stirring in my heart, calling me into the ministry. And to fast forward, when God put in my heart again the desire to fly, the desire to use an airplane as a tool to get the gospel out, I could have not had been more thrilled that God would put that vision in my heart and say, I want you to use this for me. Oh, I was so excited. So excited that I prayed on it for many, many months. Because I knew that if something of this magnitude was very, very expensive, Something of this magnitude was not only very, very expensive, but something of this magnitude outside of God being right in the middle of it. It would never come about. So I prayed on it for months. And finally, I, I took that leap, the leap of faith. And I says, Lord, I'm going to fulfill what you've called me to do. You want me to get my pilot's license so that I can use an airplane as a tool for the gospel ministry. 
I'm going to do that, Lord. I'm going to get my license. You've allowed me to. I've prayed about it. I can remember praying in my morning prayer time. Dear God in heaven, take this desire out of my heart if you're not in it. Lord, I can't, I can't wrestle with this. If you're in it, though, God, if you're in this, Lord, make it grow. And he did. I called my home church then, and see, I went to the airport almost every day. Oh, I love airplanes. And I love the ability to be able to fly. And I went to the airport every day, and I talked, and finally I talked to the old instructor there. By the way, he's still alive. I think he was in his 80s when he instructed me. I think he's still in his 80s. He's one of those guys that's like, if you meet him 30 years from now, he'll still be in his 80s. Name's Cal Weeks. He said, young man, because this little airplane out here that you could even, couldn't even see out the windows, it was so old, windows were fogged in. He said, we fly fire patrols with this airplane. And he said, because I'm contracted to fly fire patrols, I can, I can help train you for a reduced cost. And I said, how much is that? He said, it'll be $1,800. And comparatively speaking, today it's seven to $9,000 to get your private pilot's license. And uh, that's if you're proficient. If you just keep learning <laughs> and you're not proficient, you're going to keep adding dollars to it. He said, I'll contract your license for $1,800, period. End of discussion. And so I, I called my home church and I did what I felt like God had given me the liberty and a conscience to do. I asked for help. Now, a lot of times in my life, I've only told the Lord what the issue was, and I'm dealing with some things like that right now in my own personal life. That when I had my prayer time this morning, I only told Him I will tell no one else. He alone knows. But sometimes God would give me the liberty and has given me the liberty to tell others. And so I told them, and my home church said, we want to give you $1,800 to get your license. And so they sent the check. I gave them the check. I started flying. Oh, how exciting it was to think that I was now on this great adventure of getting my license, my aviation license to be able to use airplanes to facilitate the gospel into this vast region of Maine and New Brunswick and Quebec and Labrador and Greenland and all of New England. Now I would be able to do what my God had put in my heart to do, redeem the time because the days are evil. The command, the command there, the counsel that God has given us, redeeming the time, and the constraint, as he teaches us in Ephesians 5, because the days are evil. Jesus is soon to return. We must expedite the gospel. We must advance the gospel. As our last preacher so wonderfully put it, we must with great intensity go forward with the gospel. And so I could not have been more thrilled. And so I started, I started flying. It was so fun. Oh, I was so, oh, I, I ate, slept, 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 drank. I just wanted to fly all the time. I'd go up there every day, and he'd say, you need to calm down. The old, I mean, here I am in my 20s, he's in his 80s. <laughs> you know, I'm going, let's go flying. He said, on this day? I said, oh, it's an airplane. Air makes it fly. Who cares about the wind blowing 35? You really want to go flying? I do, I don't care. I mean, nothing to me. Turn the thing over on its top, I don't care. I went, all right, we'll go flying. I remember one of those days we went flying and we were training. And in that Cessna 152, my head was about going through. The, I mean, I was almost like one of them cartoon characters with my head sticking out top of the car. <laughs> I mean, and uh, I got down. I said, well, maybe we shouldn't have flown. He said, good job. Way to go, buddy. <laughs> I said, it was kind of bad. He said, now you're learning. <laughs> I mean, it was violent. It was violent that day. But I determined, I said, I said, Cal, as I begin to fly for Jesus Christ, I will have to use wisdom. I will have to use knowledge and understanding. And yes, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And I'll have to be safety because safety is of the Lord. The book of Proverbs teaches us. 
But I said, I don't want to be scared. I want to fly. So I want to fly all, all I can. And so we made an agreement that we would. I remember the first cross country put me on. Now, back then, nowadays, our airplanes, they all have modern avionics. I mean, we all have GPSs. I fly with Four Flight Mobile. If, has any of you ever heard about the, the, the program called Four Flight Mobile? Four Flight's a great program. I fly with that now. I mean, it's, it's, I mean now, but back then, I flew strictly with, with the gauges. And what they, you ever thought about this when you're flying cross country? How many of you have actually flown? Raise your hand. How many of you have your license? Raise your hand. Nobody has their license, but you've flown. How many of you are in pursuit of getting your license? Raise your hand. Oh. I want you to be in pursuit of that. But anyway, let's go on. I need money. Just come see me. I have all kinds. I'll write you a check. Now. <laughs> but we use this term called dead reckoning. Isn't that kind of a spooky term? When you're flying somewhere and you begin to check off the places you've gone over, you are dead reckoning. Interesting. I remember on my first cross country, I was so excited. I was finally getting to going across country. I checked off my first spot. How could you miss it? It was a pond about the size of this whole property. I checked it off. Yep, there I am. Time. Time looks good. Drift factor is fine. Wind's blowing out of the northwest. My drift factor is fine. I remember I checked it off, and I was going along and having, having such a wonderful time. And I remember I got the second one. I said, well, I think that's it. But I don't know if it's it. No, that's it. Now, remember, we're solo. There's nobody in the plane with me. Remember, we don't have any GPS. Remember, I don't have nothing but a compass. That's it. I mean, I have my gauges in the airplane that are controlled by the vacuum off the engine. I have a directional gyro. I have an attitude indicator. But I'm flying visual. So all I need is a compass. I think that's it. I'm going to keep going. Now, I remember I kept going. I said, that, that doesn't look right, but it must be right. So I checked it off. And uh, I flew that day for four hours. Now I want to say something. I was in a Cessna 152. It holds 22.5 gallons. At cruise, it's burning five to six gallons an hour. You do the math, and I'll tell you how close I was to running out of fuel. And so what I'd done that day was I, I, I got lost, real bad lost. Oh, I was so excited. I'm getting my license. I'm going to be flying for Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be a bush pilot because in America we don't have jungles. We have people that act like they're in jungles, but we don't have jungles. And in, and in Maine, uh, where I'm at, we have people that act like they're from jungle environment, but it's not a jungle. But I said, I'm going to get my license. I remember that day, oh, I was lost so bad. I flew down, right down. I was reading water towers trying to figure out where I was at. Oh, I was lost bad. I mean, I was lost bad. I mean, bad lost. Bad lost. <laughs> On those fire, pat fire patrols, I remember that he, he used this little instrument. Now I know it's a VOR. It stands for Very High Frequency Omnidirectional Radio Beacon. And so I remember I'd see him tune it, and I'd see this thing line up. Oh, I remember that day. I was so terrified. I couldn't get it to work. I said, but I, but I said, I bet it will work because the line of sight if I go real high. So I remember that day I was just a young pilot. only had about 13 hours. I remember I climbed up real high, up to about 6,000 feet, and I got the needle started working, and I got a heading. And I said, I've got this heading now. Now I'm going to go back. But I got up so high it scared me, so I come back down after I got a heading. I remember I was flying along that day. Never forget it back in the 90s. I looked down. I said, that is a huge airfield. That thing is big. I've never seen an airport that big. It's unbelievable. Well, I kept flying, kept flying along, flew to the Millinocket very, uh, VOR. And when I flew to the Millinocket VOR, I recognized Dolby Flowage and Millinocket Lake, and there was the airport. Oh, I was so thrilled. My heart was just pounding. I landed. He said, let me see your logbook. You land, you're supposed to get your logbook signed that you were there. He said, let me see your logbook. I said, no logbook to sign. He said, why? I said, I've been flying around for four hours. Four hours? I said, yeah. I said, I got lost. He said, well, thank the Lord you're here. Oh, yeah, I've been doing a lot of that. <laughs> I said, I thank the Lord I'm here too. And he says, uh, 
What happened? I said, I said I got lost. He said, did you not call the, the flight service station in Bangor? I said, you never taught me how to call the flight service station. I didn't tell you how to do that. You know, 80 dementia going on there. And I'm like, no. He said, I'm a dummy. I said, well, <laughs> I wanted a degree. I was trying to be respectful. What, 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 what did you, did you, did you, did you call the tower at Bangor? We got a, we got a control tower. We got Clash Charlie airspace. Did you call the tower? I said, you never taught me how to call the tower. I said, I didn't know nothing. He said, well, tell me about it. So I told him all about it. I said, the way I found my way home is I happened to be watching what you were doing when you tuned that, and I got a heading to come back, and common sense told me that the way home was like on a zero, uh, zero, uh, two, five, zero, three, zero heading right around there. I said, so I just had the idea that coming back home is northeast, and so I knew it was right or thought it was right, and I come back home, and I said, on the way back home, I did, it, I did notice something real, real weird. What was it? I said, it's a big runway, long, forever. He said, tell me more. I said, well, it had all these planes around, these military planes. And he said, how tall were you? I said, oh, I was flying around about 1,200 feet. 1,200 feet? I said, yeah, you could see it real good. I flew right over the top of it. He said, hold on just a minute. <laughs> he had to go in and call him and say, excuse me, <laughs> I think because uh, – Obviously, they would look up with their binoculars and see the tail number and know that it was my instructor's airplane. I was so excited, though. I got lost again on that same trip. Anybody want to go flying with me? <laughs> I got lost again on that same trip. Same trip, I got lost again. I said, you're not going to do this this time. It's just not going to happen. So I found this big old puff of smoke, and I went over there. I landed at this airport. If I had to do it over again, I wasn't in very, I wasn't in a, in a mood of comedy. But I landed there, and the guy looked at me and said, where are you from? Now, why am I, I'm in Norwich Walk, Maine. I, I figured if there was a smokestack, surely there must be a paper mill. And if there was a paper mill, the town surely must have an airport. Well, it did. I found it and landed. If I had to do it over again, I would have said, well, I left West Virginia about four hours ago. He was so kind, pulled me aside, said, calm down, young man, calm down. We all get lost flying. And he helped me, and I made it home that day, went to my destination, got it signed, and all learning. What you learning for? Excited, learning. Why? Because one day, one day, God was going to let me have my own airplane and fly with the message of Jesus Christ. One day, God was going to do that. He did. That day came. That day came. I got my license. I was living on just about $2,000 to $2,500 a month was all we had coming in. And back then, I called uh, Airport Owners and Pilots Association, asked them if they'd give me some money for an airplane. I needed $26,000. They gave me $26,000 on a loan. I bought it, shouted to victory, 300 something dollars a month. I said, if people have car payments, I'm going to have an airplane payment. I could advise you differently on some things, but that's I just I just said this is what God wants. This is what I'm going to do. I'm excited about it. Let's go for it. So I bought my first airplane from my good friend over here at Baptist International Missions Incorporated, Dr. Bob Green. And I uh, bought my airplane. He had just totally redone it. Oh, it was beautiful. November 830 Papa. It's a Cherokee 140. Oh, I was so excited. I said, now I'm going to use this airplane for God's glory, and I'm going to start going. It wasn't long before somebody said, can you believe this? I, I, I had someone in St. John, New Brunswick, a Christian principal, said, will you come and have a Bible club at our public school on Friday night? And I said, well, well of course we will. Why do you ask? He said, our school needs Christ. And he said, I can't do anything during the day. But he said, because I'm the principal, I can let you have any of these buildings you want at night. And we went over on Friday, had a gospel Bible club in St. John, New Brunswick. You're talking about cool. I mean, father, I remember the first time I flew. Oh, I was so, I was so excited. First time I flew with the gospel. I'm going to tell you, the class today is about aviation using it as a tool for the gospel and for church planning. We need, to, we need to not just have camels and not just have dromedaries, but today we need to have cars and not just cars, but SUVs and not just SUVs, but RV motorhomes 
And not just RV motorhomes, but airplanes. I'm still believing God for a jet or for a turboprop airplane. You said, how would that happen? Somebody, first of all, would have to give it to me, and second of all, would have to give me their credit card to put gas into it. Say amen right there. <laughs> hey, with God, all things are possible. I was so excited I would get to fly to Canada. International ministry with the gospel. So thrilled. Boy, I studied, and I went to the AOPA's site. And, of course, back then, um, you know, a lot of people think we've always had the Internet. We had to do things a little bit old-fashioned. But I remember, I remember I got all my paperwork. Oh, I was so excited. I was so thrilled that we were going to be able to go over there. I got my flight plan together, filed my flight plan, called one triple eight can pass, told him who I was. Canada is so funny. You call them on the telephone and say, I'm coming. And they go, you tell them, no, like November 5583 Julie or November 2249 Mike or uh, we owned a twin Cessna, a big twin Cessna for three years, a November 138 Mike Kilo. It stood for Mark 138. And uh, you just tell them, how many's with you? Three. Who are they? Tell them. Are you bringing any drugs in? No. Nope. Are you bringing any alcohol in? No. Nope. Do you have $10,000 cash? I'm a Baptist preacher. And you just, <laughs> you just answer all the questions. And you just take off. And when you land, you call them again. And they say, anything's changed? Nope. Have a good day. They give you a big number. Simple. When you come back into America, you're guilty as charged. It's different in America, especially since 9-11. I won't have time to tell you all that. I was flying the night of 9-11. It was spooky. It was spooky. I can't, I can't tell you, but it's just too many stories to tell. Anyway, we went over there, and I got so excited, I forgot to open my flight plan. And so when I landed in St. John, New Brunswick, they said, uh, 830 Papa request. I said, yeah, go ahead. They said, where are you coming from? I said, Millinocket, Maine. He said, uh, we have no record of your flight plan. I said, well, I filed a flight plan. It's on file. Only problem was I didn't open the flight plan. So you file a flight plan with the flight service, but you're supposed to open it. When you open it, it becomes an active flight plan. Well, I didn't open it. So in essence, I just flew into Canada just for the fun of it and landed. Not advisable. Not advisable. Boy, they got upset. They come over at me and they said, Don't you know if you landed in Halifax, you would have been staring down the end of an M16 machine gun. I said, I'm glad I didn't land there. I mean, I was just... <laughs> I, mean, I wasn't being smart, but I honestly said that. And then he didn't like that. That made him upset. What, I mean, what would you say? Well, I wish I'd land in Halifax. No. I said, look, it happened. I'm sorry. I apologize. He said, you're going to get in trouble. I remember they turned me into the Canadian FAA. And uh, oh, for months, I said, that's it. My flying career's over. That's it. Canadian FAA called me and said, about eight months later, said, um, on this day, at this time, did you fly this mission to this airport? I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, well, have you learned anything since then? I said, oh, sir, I've learned a lot. I've learned thou shalt not fly into Canada without opening your flight plan. I said, I've learned a lot. He said, tell me what else you've learned. I told him what else I'd learned. And uh, he, uh, he said, well, I hope you have a good day. And I said, sir, are you not going to do anything to me? I thought I was in trouble. He said, no, sir, you're not in trouble. He said, you've learned a good lesson. I said, are you not going to find me? He said, well, I wasn't going to. Would you like for me to find you? I said, now let's don't, let's don't go there. <laughs> he said, I, no, no, it's, it's, it's all fine. I said, thank you for your kindnesses. We were off and running, and then got our instrument rated, and then got our multi-engine rated. And you said, why would you, why would you do such a thing? Why do we fly? In Mark chapter 1 and verse number 38, the Bible says, and, and, and he said unto them, let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. Why do we do all of this? To go to another town to preach the gospel. That's why. And if you are a pastor, many of you pastoral students, one day, wherever God puts you, if you're in a, okay, put it like this. Okay, you're, who's in pastoral uh, in the class today? Okay, pastoral. Who's in missions in this class today? Okay, several of you, mission or pastoral, either one, or 
business major, whatever it may be, comes and say you come and join our church, right? And you say, uh, Pastor Bell, we're, uh, we feel like God wants us to come help you. Our pastor is, is casting the vision, and some of you need to just pick up your uh, belongings and move to another town and help a church planner. Okay, so you come to our town. What just happens to be, you come with a pilot's license. Or maybe you don't have it, but you get your pilot's license. Why are you going to get your pilot's license? You're going to get your pilot's license so that you might be able to help the church have a broader, more far-reaching ministry. So you come into that community and you said, Pastor, I just want to let you know <clears throat> that God has given me the ability to be able to fly. I got a perfect example right now. Craig Howard's coming. Craig Howard's coming to be our intern this summer. You know what he told me yesterday as he was in my motel room? He said, I love to do graphics. He said, Pastor, I'm building websites. He said, I just love it. I just, it's just so fun. I, it's really a passion of mine because I was talking about different things. I said, I said, really? So I'm in prayer this morning talking about our our." Are the preacher and his preaching a preacher's conference that I'm going to have in training preachers in New England to be to be more effective in their preaching. And I and I told him this morning, I said, Will you make me a logo and send me some examples? See, he made a mistake by telling me. <laughs> and he said, I'll be I'll be glad to do it. And and I said, and I said, none of our church plants, because they're smaller church plants, have websites. What about we built some websites this summer? He said, well, I'd be glad to do it. He's already getting weighted down already. <laughs> I mean, but you come and you said, Pastor, I can fly. And the pastor says, the Lord wants us to reach our area with the gospel. That's wonderful. Let's see what we can do about an airplane. Let's get an airplane. Will you be our pilot? Yes, I'll be your pilot. Great. Let's put a mission team together. And let's go to the next town. Let's go fly somewhere. The other day I was dealing with some discouragement in my heart. And I says, Lord, I want to do so much with the gospel. And I want to go to so many places. I, I really would like to have help, Lord. Would you, would you give me some encouragement today, Lord? And I got an email from a pastor in Connecticut. And it said like this, Pastor Bell, we've never met. But I heard that you use aviation as a tool to get the gospel out. Pastor Bell, I have a commercial pilot that flies, used to fly for Delta that now flies for another airlines in my church, her and her husband want to get the gospel out. And they want to be a part of what you're doing. Will you come down and meet with us so that we might be able to evangelize Block Island and we might be able to evangelize Fisher's Island and that we might be able to evangelize Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket? Will you come down and meet with us? It's on schedule. I'm going down there in May and we're going to meet. What are we going to meet about? Oh, we're going to meet so we can have a fly-in so we can go out and eat a hamburger. Oh, please. We're going to meet so we can talk about how to get the gospel to all those islands. You know, to go to one of those islands would take you hours to get out there, but an airplane, it takes 10 minutes. That's it. It's 10 minutes. From where he's at, I'll land at Groton, Groton, Connecticut. I'll fly from Groton, Connecticut, landed there before, I'll, Tweed, New Haven, either one of them. I can fly from there to one of those islands in 10 minutes or less. By the way, uh, a few years ago, my, my girl was in college there at New England, Pastor Townsley's uh, school, and I dropped her off on a Monday morning. I went down and preached at International Bible College when it was still going on Long Island. I left my house, and I flew 35 minutes, dropped her off. I flew from Connecticut, central part of Connecticut, around Hartford. I flew 10 minutes to Long Island, New York. Isn't that crazy? Long Island, New York. I preached. I left at 1, and I was back home in Maine at 2. It doesn't even make sense, does it? One time I had an evangelist with me. He, he, he's an evangelist out of Tennessee Temple, evangelist Bobby Brown. And he came to our church. I said, we're going to do something special today. We're going to go look at one of our mission churches. So we left at about 9 in the morning. At about 9.30, we landed on an island off the coast of Maine. And we spent our time there till about 11. Fellowship and looking at what God was doing there. A little after 11, we flew to Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. It was a 30-minute flight. I fed him lobster. He, just, he, he said, what is going on? You, you, you flew me to Nova Scotia. You're feeding me lobster. We left there a little bit after 2. Cleared customs. Was back home at 3 o'clock, ready for the 7 o'clock gospel meeting that night. He said, my head is spinning. He said, we flew. We went to an island. We had a fellowship with a, with, a, with a pastor. We flew from an island to Nova Scotia. You fed me lobster. We flew back to America. He says, my head is messed up. 
And I said, well, join the club. It's just amazing. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, we must expedite the gospel with intensity, with intensity. We must say, we must get the gospel. How's it going to be done? Trust the Lord. Maybe some of you would say, Pastor Bell, God wants me to get my license. Trust the Lord with the funds to get them. Get the funds. I remember one day I was praying, oh, I wanted my helicopter license so bad. 1215 here, sir, Brother Gamble, 1215. 1215 still, 1215. Oh, I wanted to get my helicopter license so bad. And this guy told me, he says, I want you to come meet this guy. He was a Pentecostal friend of mine. And um, difference doctrine, but we had fellowship around Christ on an individual Christian basis. And every year he called me and said, you need to meet my man. He's a very wealthy man. He'll help you. I said, no, we're not hucksters. We don't deal like that. And I said, if that man wants to help me, he can come meet me. And for years I put him off. And one time uh, he called me. My, my wife and kids and I were cutting our winter's wood. Some of you have been there to help me cut my winter's wood. Maybe if any of you in this class have been here to help me cut my winter's wood. We do that for the quartet that comes with Brother Crichton. Don't tell him. But they were, my family and I were out cutting our winter's wood, and he called me and he said, I want you to go. And you know what the Spirit of God said? He said, go. Hmm. So I went. I met with this man. He owned a large corporation in New Hampshire. I sat on his front porch of his nice house, very nice house, by the way. He said, Pastor Bell, tell me your story. So I started testifying how God saved me, how God called me, how God put in my heart. He said, what's, what's really burning in your heart right now? I said, I'd love to get my helicopter license. He said, how much would that be? He said, that'd be $10,000. He walked into the room and come back with a check for $10,000. He said, go get your helicopter's license. I said, I can't take it. He said, why? I said, because my airplane's broke. And it doesn't make sense to go get my helicopter's license with an airplane that's broke. I said, so I can't take it. He said, I'll take the money, fix the airplane. God gave it to you once. He'll give it to you again. I'm still waiting for the again, but amen, I thank the Lord for the once. Believe God for it. Believe God for the money. You said, what are we going to do about an airplane? Pray fast. Pray fast and pray. Ask God to do something special. And when he does it, we'll have to catch you. You'll be running all the way down by Chattanooga with your handkerchief out, waving it. God gave me an airplane. God gave me an airplane. Pastor Sexton, you'll go up to Pastor Sexton and say, Pastor, I fasted and prayed and I saw the God of heaven. He gave me an airplane. Church needs to hear this story. Come on up to the platform. <laughs> and, and you said, can God? Oh, God can. God can. Yes, he can. So why are we doing this? To get the gospel to the next towns. I hastily went over this on Monday. But can I just show you in the next two minutes, and then I'll leave one minute for questions. Can you look in Mark 1? And see in verse 16, now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother. Does everybody see that? If you see that, say amen. Can you look with me in verse 19? And when he had gone a little further, thence he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John. Can I tell you that in the next towns, there's servants that will be called of God to do the gospel ministry. They're not are they in this town? Yes. They're in this town. But what about the next town? Aren't there ones in the next town? Yes. And Jesus Christ said, let us go in the next town. You know why He said, let us go in the next town? Because He knew, the God-man knew, that there was more James and Johns. He knew that there were more Simon and Andrews. He knew that. We have to get under a burden that there's more souls in other towns that need the gospel. May the Lord help us to see that. In the next towns, there's men to be called. In the next town, there's a doctrine that needs to be spread. Look what happened in verse 22. And they were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one that had authority and not. What is doctrine? Doctrine is teaching. What, what needs to happen in the next towns? The teachings of Christ. That's what needs to happen in the next towns. We gotta go to another town. 
There's Simon and Andrews. There's James and John's. There's the gospel of Christ that needs to be spread. There's people that need to get saved. In the synagogue, in verse 23, there's a man with an unclean spirit. Christ touched him. In verse 34, the Bible says, And he healed many that were sick with divers' disease. Where are all of these people? They're in the next towns. They're just in the next town. And you can either, you can either have a modernistic philosophy that says build a kingdom, or you can have a Bible philosophy, Bible truth, Bible doctrine that says, yes, you have a mother church, a reproducing church, which is what we have here, but training others to go there. That's what it's doing. There's a plan. Why? Because in those next towns, there's people for whom Christ died. And so how are we going to get to those next towns? Well, Brother Bell, I'm going to go down to the dude ranch. And I'm going to get me a horse. Well, I don't know that that's the wisest thing to do. Maybe you can have a horse for recreation. Maybe that helps you calm your mind. But I don't think we need to take a horse to the next. I think we need to use something modern. Hence, I propose to you today. Aviation, a tool for the gospel ministry. Let's get at it. Let's get our license. Let's finish up our license. Let's pray in an airplane. And all of you move to Maine and help me know. <laughs> you knew that was coming, didn't you? Uh, we do need help. We do need help. And we need help in New England. We need your help. My time actually has come and gone, but maybe you would want to stay and let the food get just a mite cold for a question. Is there a question? Sir. Yes, you have to get you have to get certified, and that's and that's with a uh, an instructor checkout, right? It's it's somewhat simple. It usually takes four hours. I don't have my seaplane rating. One of the reasons why is because every place we've ever flown has has land based services, but it is a neat thing, and I would encourage anybody that feels like God wants them to do it to do it. But it's only an add on. It's about four hours. Add on. Now, I've flown in seaplanes a lot, but I've actually never got. I don't have my rating. Just like I don't have my tell will endorsement. I, I fly try try uh, a gear. Yes, what else? Get up. Anything else? All right. Yes. Oh, I'm glad you asked that. That's a good question. I have a scooter and it folds up and it has a weed whacker engine on the back of it. It actually is a real live scooter. It's made by GoPad, GoPad.com. It goes 30 miles an hour. One of the coolest things you'll ever get on. Have you seen it? Have you worked on it? Um, he's worked on my scooter because he's, he's, he's done some intern work for us before. Brother Fuller has. But uh, I have a scooter. It goes 30 miles an hour. I fold it up. I get out of my airplane. I get on it, and I go soul winning. It's pretty neat, actually. I mean, could you imagine flying somewhere? Open up a scooter, cranking up the weed whacker engine and driving around town on a little scooter. It sometimes looks a little sissified, but you get over it. I mean, you try to act manly when you're driving it. You know, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, it is. But hey, it's transportation. Next. Next. Anybody else? Come see us sometime. We'll fly you around. And um, hopefully, hopefully out of these last few days, I pray that God will birth in your heart as he already has done, but I pray he would water it. And I pray that I would hear good news in these coming days. Maybe one of you would drop me an email. Pastor, Brother Bell, I, I was challenged. I'm finished my license. I'm going on. We've heard that happen so many times. I took a Brother Badgett. Brother Badgett's with B-I-M-I. Brother Badgett is. And I took him to get a hamburger one day at a little country airstrip. We landed. I said, you need this in South Africa. You need this. You need it. Six months later, he called me. He said, Brother Bell, I just want to let you know I passed my lessons. He said, I'm a pilot. What? He said, well, you told me to go get my license. Boy, it scared me. <laughs> I said, he actually did what I said. <laughs> I've had that happen many times. Maybe that had happened with you. Yes, brother. You're, it's, it, there's crossover, but you, you'll have no problem. If you get America license, you have no problem. You'll have to run, jump through a couple hoops. It's all it's different in every country, but you'll have no problem if you get your license right here. Yes, anybody else? All right, 
Let's go eat. It's already four minutes late. God bless you. You've been a good class today, and I hope the Lord's helped us. Thank you.